All right, my name is Pranav and, I meet, uh, and uh, I'm joined with Jakob to talk about um, uh, how uh, users can deliver their modern apps um, anywhere, both publicly and privately. The, uh, what we've seen as the most recent trends is developers are adopting new approaches in order to deliver their services faster. Um, they've moved from uh, the private data center to one public cloud, which is the hybrid cloud. But now uh, they're actually uh, users and developers are trying to adopt multiple public clouds as well as the edge so that they can deliver the apps uh, or services faster by leveraging the best of each cloud. For example, maybe ML from Google or, or maybe some service from, uh, from, uh, uh, from AWS or some service from Azure and try to leverage best of each service so that they can develop new services faster. Um, similarly, uh, in the previous decade, users went from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from legacy apps and virtualized the apps into VMs, but now developers are adopting new uh, application architectures such as microservices, containers, and even serverless in order to um, uh, develop and, and, and also deliver the new services faster. And, and the third big trend obviously was the, 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 the move to agile and, and actually doing it uh, uh, and actually um, uh, um, delivering the services faster, but, but, but now it has actually become continuous, especially continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment, continuous delivery, as well as continuous verification of the application. So it's a constant iterative uh, software development process. And all of this has been done by developers in order to deliver their services faster. Um, however, delivering an app is not just developing the app. To actually deliver the app to the, so that it can be consumed by a user involves multiple point products and multiple teams. And these teams, they communicate using sort of support tickets. And because there are so many multiple point products, nearly seven of them, there's multiple iterations that, need, that you need to go through in order to deliver this app to this user. Each of these iterations takes uh, days to weeks in order to get it right. And, and meanwhile, your app is not static. Your app is continuously changing. The user, the, uh, uh, the developer is, because of the whole continuous integration, uh, delivery, deployment, and verification, the APIs are changing. So this whole process is continuously uh, being iterative and taking longer as a result. And what is the end impact of this? The developer is developing their app faster. They are going actually going fast. However, because they're going fast and because the current tools are, are point products are siloed, each of the individual teams, both DevOps and the network ops, network IT, they're also called infrastructure and operations, they are actually getting overwhelmed and burdened because of this constant changes in the application. And this is negating all the efficiencies that the developer has gained by adopting a modern app approach. Let's look at why does it take so long to deliver the app? Like just let's look at firstly, how long does it take? First, in order to deliver the app, you need to first obviously have some form of app management, which is either either you can have your own uh, Kubernetes cluster or your virtual machine, for example. So you have that. Then if you have a Kubernetes cluster, then you need an ingress controller so that you can uh, direct traffic uh, to this cluster from the outside. 
once you have that then you need an app uh, an application firewall an app firewall which essentially protects your app to app traffic so protects traffic coming into the application next once you have that then then obviously you need to expose this app publicly you you you, you actually want to scale both your application firewall as well as your application so you need a load balance in front so that you can scale this horizontally right and this load balance is where you will basically terminate your ssl connection and you you will you'll actually terminate uh, uh, you will actually uh, uh, decrypt your traffic so you you need a load balancer to do those functions in front of the load balancer you want to protect that you actually don't want it to be overwhelmed by malicious traffic so therefore you will add a uh, network firewall so that you can uh, block uh, 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 malicious traffic coming into the load balancer then in front of that you need a router because you need the traffic to actually come in here so you need to you need a way to advertise the uh, the routes the app reachability to the outside world and then in front of it this is in your data center so this is right here is your data center in front of it you actually need like a ddos because you don't want to saturate the link between the user and your data center so you need a ddos to uh, block uh, traffic um, uh, block malicious traffic coming in and only allow the good traffic so you want the ddos which is away from your data center outside your data center that is blocking malicious traffic and only allowing good traffic ensuring that this link doesn't get saturated so you need all of these different components before your app that your developer developed can be exposed to the internet and allow users to talk to the app let's look at the time that it takes this part the creating a kubernetes cluster and creating an ingress controller is you know has become pretty fast mainly because of the whole infrastructure as code uh, there are these recipes available charts available so you can actually do that pretty fast about two days for each two to three days for each so that's that's you know is, is becoming quick but when you start getting into all of these other components the app delivery components such as you know app firewall that takes some time to actually tune the app firewall in order to reduce the false positive to, to figure out what needs to be blocked what uh, do you turn on only the os or do you turn on something else or what rules do you turn on right so that takes some time to tune uh, then to figure out load balancer to actually program the certificate to actually create ssl certification and to do and to actually create an virtual ip and all of those take some time as well it takes about one to two weeks same with the network firewall and the router each of these take about one to two weeks and in case of DDoS, because it's you're working with 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 with, uh, with the component that is outside your data center, which is not which is not doesn't have uh, does, it's not uh, it's not modern in terms of having all of these uh, 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 um, click to turn it on um, and uh, and and configure easily and and, and quickly or, or doing it using code, uh, it takes longer. So it takes about two to three weeks to actually configure DDoS. As well. So the total time that is taken by this app is to deliver the app is about seven to twelve weeks. To and in this case, all we're doing is we're delivering this uh, the API publicly. Now let's take an example of how long does it take to deliver the app privately. Which means I have an app, I have an API, and I only want uh, either uh, my uh, my partner app, which is sitting in another uh, another cloud, to access it, or um, or um, uh, or my partner customer um, or my business partner to access the app privately in their own data center. So say I have an app here in um, um, in the uh, in my private data center. I want uh, this app to talk to another app which is sitting in the public cloud and I only want this app to talk to this app. I don't want this app to be or API to be exposed publicly on the internet. So in order to do that, all the other components remain the same. In addition, what you need to do is you need to actually have a private connectivity link between your private data center and your public cloud. In addition, you also need to have a VPN so that these two can be in the same network. And you also need to have this private link, which could be, for example, Direct Connect or Express Route, 
or uh, or essentially any 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 private layer to connectivity between the two right so you could either do vpn over the internet you could have a private link and then do a vpn on top of it uh, there are multiple architectures but all of this actually takes an additional three to four weeks so to deliver an app or api privately it takes about nine to fifteen weeks Now, if you look at this, why does it take so long to deliver uh, an app? And is this right for a modern app? The developer is sitting there going, I've already, I'm, I'm gaining my efficiency. I'm actually going faster. I'm actually adopting new architectures. But you're telling me that all of that efficiency is negated because of the existing mechanisms of delivering an app what is the right approach that developers devops as well as network and it and infrastructure and operations team should look for when your developer is going to use modern apps we call that approach a distributed cloud approach and the key differences between a distributed cloud approach and the current approach is what i'm describing in this slide the first thing that you need when you are delivering modern apps is you cannot work with multiple point products. As I said, the app delivery is now, uh, uh, the application uh, uh, um, creation is a continuous process, right? Everyone's trying to move faster. If you have multiple point products and silos where you have to go one after the other using support tickets to say, please, Issue me an IP address. Please open this port. Please configure the IP address. Please configure a rule, uh, a network firewall rule for this IP address. Oh, by the way, my app died, came back up, and everything changed again. Please do a new IP address and so forth. It will not work in a modern AM approach. So you cannot have multiple point products. You need essentially an integrated stack of these application delivery components, which can which can move which can move fast and nimbly uh, in response to uh, changes in the apps and the APIs because these are continuously changing. The second thing is the location of the app is no longer just one location, one data center. It's actually multiple locations. It is data center, uh, uh, a public cloud, a network cloud, maybe in the edge, so you need the same infrastructure components everywhere, wherever you want to distribute your application. So the number of places where you need to manage these, uh, these different infrastructure components is increasing. It's not just one, it's actually multiple. And therefore an appliance based model where you're managing each appliance one by one will no longer scale. Because now you're talking about deploying in multiple regions multiple availability zones, multiple clouds, multiple places in the network, both the uh, um, cloud network edge, and in case of edge, multiple thousands of edges. So you cannot scale this using an appliance-based model. You need a distributed fleet operations model where you're managing this entire thing as a fleet, wherein you're creating, you're defining your intent once, you define your intent once and saying, this is how it should work, and, and the system should take care of, of distributing the configuration to all these different locations where the application exists. So you need a distributed fleet operation approach. And to do that, the critical component, which goes and said, is you need a control plane based management. You need a control plane to distribute the state, to distribute the reachability. You cannot rely on a management plane approach of, of, of going one by one to every appliance. Third thing is, once you've configured it, how do you manage this? With seven different products, you have seven different port panes of glass where you need to go and uh, see um, uh, seven different uh, things. You cannot uh, troubleshoot a problem fast because you have to go to seven different planes of glass. You need to also then go to, uh, you, even if you uh, take all of the, um, um, the 
the metrics, the logs, put it all in a centralized system, there still isn't a way to thread the request uh, together from one um, tool to the other. How do you thread a request or how do you uniquely create a, a single pattern of a request from like from the router all the way to your app? How do you know what is the key to in which you can you can you can uniquely join all these different tables? And the fourth thing is um, uh, the the lifecycle management of it. The current tools are operationally complex because they're all appliance based. So you have to now and you and that worked fine when you had one location, two locations. If you're talking about multiple of locations, it's very hard to do lifecycle management of it manually. You need a full SaaS based operations approach uh, with full lifecycle management built in. So it should be fully managed. And that's what you should look for. And lastly, if you want to scale uh, to different locations, you cannot have the same form factor uh, like a hardware or maybe a, a really thick uh, uh, virtual machine that, that that's uh, uh, in order to deploy it anywhere. You need something that is deployable in, in multiple thousands of clusters. And that is what uh, uh, developers, DevOps, network uh, infrastructure teams, as well as the IT team should look for when they are considering uh, app delivery for their uh, modern applications. Let's look at once a, now that I've shown you what what the what are the key tenets of a uh, distributed cloud approach that that the developers and DevOps and network ops should look for. Let's look at how it, how it will work. How would you deliver a modern app you, publicly using this distributed cloud approach? So today, if you remember, I had there were a bunch of uh, components over here like the Ingress controller, VAF. What you would first do is first you would essentially replace those components with uh, with a distributed cloud uh, architecture. You replace you replace or maybe you could you could do a new application using uh, uh, using this distributed cloud approach. You're not getting rid of your um, uh, of your existing infrastructure components. You're keeping your existing infrastructure components. This distributed cloud approach can essentially work over the top of that, right? So the uh, so, so you'll first have that. The second thing is the distributed cloud approach should actually have its own network where you can advertise these applications publicly. Right, uh, so that this becomes easier. So the first thing that you should do is it should essentially you could have de deployed your app anywhere. You could have deployed it in your existing Kubernetes cluster or your VM or, or so forth. Uh, so it should discover what apps have already been deployed. Once it discovers this, it should have a control plane. And again, this control plane is critical. This control plane is essentially uh, advertising application reachability. It's not describing routing. It's not just describing, uh, uh, like you know, the the the, the uh, layer three routing. It's actually describing application layer reachability that says to to reach API one, not IP address one, but API one. Here's how you reach this API, right? And then it also distributes app app health. So you need, you need to distribute that. Once you once you once you once you have sort of used a control plane, the next thing is you need you uh, you need to then advertise the app. So if you advertise the app publicly. In this case, we're advertising the app publicly. So you, the distributed cloud approach should enable the user to actually advertise the uh, to choose where you want to uh, uh, advertise the app. In this case, we're advertising the app on, for example, a public pop using an AnyCast virtual IP. This will direct the traffic from the users onto here. Then the fourth thing using a distributed cloud approach is you should then have the ability to distribute uh, app delivery functions closer to where the data is generated or to where the user is. In this case, for example, we should have the ability to distribute, for example, um, SSL offload uh, closer to the user. This way, you are you are uh, you are improving the application performance. The second thing is you, you should have the ability to distribute uh, a web application firewall functions closer to the user. This way, you are actually protecting your applications you are farther away from your data centers. You are protecting it right here, and and all the malicious traffic is blocked right here. 
rather than having it backhauled to your data center and being blocked in your data center right so you should have the ability to distribute your different uh, application delivery components closer to uh, uh, where the data is generated or where the user is and then lastly in order to make sure your performance is good you should have a persistent connection between uh, from the front end all the way to the uh, to your origin so so that you, you're not doing multiple tls setups for your application this is what a um, how you would deliver an app publicly using a distributed cloud approach let's take the same example of delivering an app in this case privately from one site to another site using the distributed cloud approach again here uh, we are saying keep your existing app delivery components so keep it as it is don't 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 get rid of it but you deploy a distributed cloud um, application gateway over here and then this application gateway as i said first it should deliver it should discover what apps are configured right second thing is you need to have a global you need to have private connectivity you should have, you should look for you for, for solutions that essentially incorporate private connectivity to all different components both your private cloud and your public cloud so you can have private links with each of these so that you don't have to set it up yourself right the service comes with the solution comes with that and all you're doing here is you're discovering your app in your control plane you're now advertising the app reachability to the site where you want the uh, app to be consumed from in this case we want to be consumed from this side and then here is where you advertise the app privately to that site so this app now is reachable only from this site so this is done using policy it's not reachable from the internet so you cannot have traffic coming in from here this will not be allowed or should not be allowed by any solution that is offering this this app should only be reachable from this location and now you can choose to distribute your app delivery functions closer to where the traffic is being generated in this case you can distribute maybe ssl termination or web application firewall right here so that all traffic malicious traffic is blocked over here and is not backhauled to this side and then lastly because this is a completely private connection this is not going over the internet this essentially reduces your risk profile of your traffic so this is completely layered to connection it uh, you're not exposed to the vagaries of the internet um, such as congestion and so forth now let's take a look at what is the benefit of using this distributed cloud approach what is the impact on um, on the different teams if you see these uh, uh, if you see the distributed cloud approach and and actually Yakub will show you how long it takes uh, we are going from order of weeks to order of minutes and hours essentially right um, so it's a it's a significant improvement in terms of the time taken what that mean what that what that uh, what that means for uh, the uh, for DevOps is that now they can actually deliver new services faster. They can actually keep up with what the developer is, is doing. Um, and so instead of, instead of the app delivery taking say three months, four months, which means in a given year, you can only do like three or four services. You now can actually deliver new services almost every week or every, every two weeks, right? So you can actually deliver new services faster. So you can go from three to 11 which means now you're basically bringing in more top line revenue to the organization, right? The second benefit is that with, with the different locations, such as private cloud, public cloud, network and so forth, you need to have different teams to manage each of these different locations. Um, so in this case, so this, this, uh, this customer um, who, who, uh, who, who went through this, they actually had a team of 25 with almost 15 QA and 10 DevOps to manage these different locations and to manage these different point products. But now, by, 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 by using just one point product, by using just one product and in different locations, they can significantly reduce their operational team 
from about 25 down to 5, which saved them a significant amount of money as well. And the third um, component of this is that troubleshooting problems, this is like day, day three, um, since you had to go to 300, uh, since you had to go to multiple uh, portals, uh, it took about five to six hours to, to troubleshoot you know, every incident. By using a single pane of glass um, and a single um, uh, distributed cloud approach, um, they can reduce the um, the operational time or the troubleshooting time from 300 minutes down to 15 minutes per incident. And this saves a significant amount of time so that they can focus less on troubleshooting problems and more on delivering new services and more on the top line. Or focus on the more high value items rather than focusing on infrastructure level components that do not add um, uh, business value uh, to their company. So this is the business impact of going with a distributed cloud approach compared to the existing multiple point product siloed approach. Um, so after, I've, I've spoken a lot about this in the slides, but uh, I'll hand it over to Jakob that he can talk about, uh, he can show you some of the distributed cloud approaches and, uh, and how, how, uh, how easy it would be to actually configure using this approach. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, can you hear me and see the slide? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So now I <coughs> prepared a short demonstration of uh, Pranav Explained. Uh, so we want to show you also some real stuff and how, how hard it is to do it or how easy and um, how it looks. So basically I decided that I will pick simple up. Uh, I didn't want to do complex microservice for this demonstration. So I took like the common uh, application in this case, which is uh, WordPress and MySQL. And what I have in my <clears throat> demo setup is vanilla Kubernetes cluster running in a virtual machine in private data center. And uh, I think I'm using Calico as a, a CNI plugin. So really vanilla, vanilla topology and two pods, one WordPress, one MySQL. And uh, to do this action in a normal world, as Pranav explained, uh, and I have uh, very good experience with this, that usually this part, uh, is handled by DevOps people and people like me, which is pretty doable and it can be pretty fast. So you set up VM with a Kubernetes, you deploy Nginx ingress controller, you, you will use the Let's Encrypt um, uh, cert manager, right? Which will give you automatically certificates. You can do all this stuff. But then my issue always uh, was the left side where if you are in big company, you need to uh, create a support ticket for the network team. And then it takes, if you are lucky, it takes three days, but it can also take two weeks to set up the firewall and all this stuff here, right? And it is not very flexible and also hard to debug. I will also show this. So to map it, what you will see in my demo is, I will basically, uh, will not need left side. I will focus here and I will have my vanilla WordPress because most of the people today, they already have a Kubernetes running and they want to expose uh, DDoS protection for their site and they want to use web application firewall and they want to have a central visibility uh, uh, through one console. So that is my uh, goal in this uh, demo. So what you will see, so here I have a private data center and this is a Volterra global backbone with a few global pops and distributed anycast where I am going to advertise the site and here is the end user. Uh, so as a first step, I will discover the app. So in my other virtual machine, 
I decided that I will run uh, Volt Mesh as a virtual machine. You can run it as a pod in the Kubernetes as well, but you, uh, in this case, I'm running it in the separated virtual machine. I will load the cube config. It will auto discover all the services in this cluster. Then because I have a distributed control plane, I can immediately have a reachability anywhere and I can expose an application locally, globally, in different data center very easily, you will see it. And I'm getting all this uh, for free. Now, next step, I will advertise it on Anycast. So it will be uh, accessible from the closest uh, routable point. And then I will configure SSL offloading and web application firewall, and we can do rate limiting or uh, service policies for specific ASN. So there are multiple combinations what we can do. And then the user will access this and he will uh, uh, end up in my private DC on the WordPress. So now let's, let's go ahead and start. Uh, so this is my uh, terminal and I really have just single node uh, VM and if we take a look, I am using uh, Calico as a CNI plugin. So it's really uh, like most popular plugin what people use. So nothing special, uh, very simple setup. And in default namespace, I deployed WordPress and MySQL. Uh, and I am using, uh, I, I created services, service for the WordPress. Now, uh, let's take a look how we will configure the Vault Mesh through console. So this, this is a Vault console, which brings the central uh, view. I am based in Prague. So I deployed Vault Mesh virtual machine in the DC Prague site. And I, I have a visibility, so I see the, the health and basic information about this, uh, about this node. I, I can go inside and see how much, how much traffic is going through this, uh, through this node. So this is like a system view. Uh, I can see the uh, number of nodes. So it's a single node, uh, VM. Uh, I can read the IP address, utilization, uh, metrics from CPU memory. So this is like a overview. Uh, in, in our co console, we call it site, uh, and my site is uh, uh, DC Prague. Now, to start with the first step, I need to discover WordPress service and all services which are there. So I go to service discovery section, and in service discovery, we will create a new config for DC Prague. And we need to say where, where, my, where I want to discover. Uh, we have concept of virtual site. If you would like to discover from multiple site um, by single config, or I can choose the site. In this case, I will say I, I want to discover on my Prague, DC Prague. And I want to discover on local network. So basically the, uh, there is a local connectivity between the Vault Mesh node and Kubernetes cluster. Now, uh, today we support console and Kubernetes. I'm using Kubernetes, so I keep Kubernetes, I do configure, and now it is asking me to uh, provide a kube config. Uh, kube config, I can, uh, I can either give a plain text, clear secret, or we have mechanism how to encrypt the secret. So it can be decrypt only uh, in the target location and it cannot be uh, decrypted centrally. In this case, I will go with clear secret and we need the cube config. So this is my cube config, right? With the private IP where I am sitting. So I will just copy cube config and I will paste it here. Uh, 
one more option what I what I can choose is uh, if I have a pod isolated or if they are reachable. So in case of Calico, uh, since what my support BGP peering, I could even do the BGP peering between uh, Calico route reflectors and and my volt mesh. But since I did really basic Calico deployment, it is using some VXLAN encapsulation and I cannot reach the pods, so I keep pods are isolated. It means that it will use a node port for the service. Then I could configure some other stuff like publishing web services, but this is not the for our today demo, so I can just save it. And if I refresh, you can see it discovered four services. And one of the service is uh, WordPress default, which is matching exactly what, uh, what we saw in my terminal. You can see, right? So this is the, uh, this is the service and it is, it is the same. So now <clears throat> I discovered the endpoint and it's time to go and um, create uh, HTTP load balancer. Uh, before I create HTTP load balancer, uh, I have to configure the origin pool because uh, WordPress requires special route config to, to be able to work. So I will go and create origin pool, which is basically saying where my uh, WordPress is running, where is it served. So we can go and say uh, WordPress and it will be Kubernetes service. It will be WordPress default, site is Prague. Uh, I am discovering it on uh, outside network and port, port is 8080. I can create health checks, I can create TLS, in this case I am using Insecure on the Kubernetes, so we can, um, the service is exposed on port 80, so I will keep it as is. Now, um, WordPress requires um, uh, route host rev write to be able to work. So what I did before this demo, this is really WordPress specific. I created the, the, uh, the route object where I will just now add the, uh, add the origin pool. So that should be uh, easy to do. Okay, and it's... Uh, it's actually there, so we don't need to do anything. Now, uh, let's create the HTTP load balancer. So to create HTTP load balancer, uh, we can say WordPress and domain. So for domain, I decided I will use uh, delegated domains. So what it means, uh, in the system namespace, we have ability to delegate. So this is my domain which I own app vkts.io and uh, you can delegate it to us and then we automatically provide let's encrypt certificates and we manage DNS records. It's an optional thing. So, so before I had to create this NS record and delegate my domain. So now I can create any, any uh, HTTP load balancer and automatically I get certificates uh, from let's encrypt and everything. So the way how it is configured is, uh, I can say here if I want automatic certificates, then it will use the delegate domains, or I can bring my own certificate. Uh, in case that I have my own, I can use this and upload the key and cert. I will use automatic and the domain. Domain will be uh, wordpress.appvkts.io. Now I want to have HTTP to uh, uh, HTTP redirect to HTTPS. And I will use my route config, which we uh, configured. So for the route config, I will just choose the object what, uh, what I had there. And now the almost the last point is where I want to advertise 
the configuration. So in this case, we want to advertise it on the internet, so it will be globally available, but uh, we have other options like you can advertise it locally in the cluster or in the different specific location. In this case, it will be internet. And then uh, what we want to also do is we want to configure the WAF. So to configure WAF, I can actually, I have uh, two options. Either I know exactly what I want and I am um, someone who understands a web application firewall very well. So I will define my own rules and reference the rules or I will do the WAF intent. Uh, in this case, I want to show you the WAF intent and the way how I will do it is I will create new WAF WordPress and I can just simply choose PHP and WordPress and it will automatically pre-configure right profile for me, right application profile what I want. And this is important. I can say, do I want to block attack when it is detected or I can raise the alert. Uh, I will demonstrate the attack. So let's do the block and you will see how it blocks my, my, rec my attack when, uh, when we will try it from the laptop. So this is the WAF configuration and that's it. I think now we can just uh, save it. And what will happen is that it will start the DNS domain verification and in a few, few minutes, uh, we should have our uh, uh, our load balancer ready and we can actually try it. So do domain challenge verified and in in, in a few secs it, uh, it should be there. Certificate valid. So the vhost is ready. Uh, this is my domain and we can actually try yes and this is my wordpress site so you see how quick it was it uh, and i have valid certificate i have even re a redirect i should have right should redirect me so you can uh, you can all try let me uh uh, let me see where is the chat window. So I'm going to send it to everyone. So you can guys open in chat and you can try to open the site and we will uh, we will see the, some traffic. So now what I can do is I can start generating some traffic. So it will be it will be visible there that we are, uh, that someone is coming to the site. Okay, so I'm generating the traffic uh, to the sites. Uh, site is running. And uh, this is what I've just shown you is how hard it is to do configuration. So it really took like 15 minutes, including explanation. And we have uh, configured easily uh, WordPress, which is running somewhere in, in the private data center. Uh, without direct uh, public IP or anything. It's just sitting somewhere on the internet connection and that's, that's all what is needed. Now uh, we can go back and we can take a look on troubleshooting part and the visibility. This is important. Again, if, if, if I... Sorry, this is this is my Google Home Assistant. Okay, uh, he got crazy. He started playing some music. Okay, uh, so in normal world, uh, it is very hard to troubleshoot, right? And some, and I have a good experience that. Uh, even to get the latency between all these places very stacked or the locks, you really need to build a solid monitoring 
and logging where you will send all those logs and you will have very good visibility and it takes time to build it. And sometimes uh, hard problems, troubleshooting of hard problems can take even three hours to figure out where the actual problem is, right? If it is on firewall because something, some IP address is blocked there or it is in the WAF, right? Just tune WAF for your rules is a sometimes complicated exercise to, to find the right rules. Uh, and it can take uh, days, to even weeks to tune all the various things, especially when you have some uh, custom application. So all this is very hard to do. And uh, I'm not saying that with this it's easy. Uh, it is also hard, but you have everything in central place. So it's not about uh, that you don't need to do troubleshooting and it's just magical, will work always. No, but you have a single page where you can see all the logs, all the metrics, latency between locations, and all this information are there. You can integrate, uh, uh, in do integration with the notifications to your exist external systems. You can send logs to your uh, Splunk or uh, or Datadog. So we have all these integrations and it is much faster to debug such a problem. Uh, to show you what I mean is, let's uh, do the quick overview. So you see what data uh, we are getting and how, how, how looks the visibility part. So you saw the config part. Now we can actually take a look on the application traffic. And on the application traffic, we can see that now from the public network, traffic is flowing, looks like people started opening the site because it's really flowing from Singapore, San Jose, London, Amsterdam and Paris. So this is all our pops and then it goes to BC Prague. So we see that literally from all the places it is coming right now. So this is like a application traffic visibility. Now I'm going to go inside the HTTP log balancer itself and I can go on WordPress. Now, and what we see here, this is pretty nice because the average latency between client and our uh, global backbone log balancer is 25 milliseconds, but then it takes 140 milliseconds to reach actual uh, volt mesh via virtual machine running in the DC and then less than one millisecond to go to the application. So this is like total upstream. So you can see here, we see that we have total 14 unique visitors in last five minutes. I can see which operation system they are using top clients, right? So top is uh, Paris. This is probably my watch, well, my generator. I'm reaching Paris. Browser type, TLS, uh, top ASN, right? So I have all this information. Now I can read the metrics. So I can see the request rate. And right now it's a one request per second uh, in last hour uh, because we just launched it. Uh, I can see the traffic. So majority traffic goes to Paris and San Jose. Now, uh, the interesting part is the is the requests. So re here I'm getting sampled request rate and I can filter by code. I can filter it by country, by ASN, top source IP. So this is my IP fingerprints, right? And let's take a look on some US requests which are coming and we should be able to see so here is one of the client IP and we can take a look. We see the latency for this particular client and uh, duration, type of OS. And also we should see the country, which instance it reached, right? ASN and city, right? So this is the basic info of what I am getting from every every request very easily i can filter out 400 if i and keep just 200 right and easily i can uh, navigate and see all the requests which which are coming 
Now we have a more features like API endpoints, like machine learning, but that would have to run for more than one hour to get some, to learn some stuff and, and display it. But uh, now let's take a look on the, on the application firewall and security events. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, generate uh, attack or attack. So WordPress has some open source tool called uh, WordPress scan and um, you can run it and it can tell you what version is there, what is available to do and potentially uh, you can try to hack the system. So let's see, right? So I will run basic uh, enumerate and you can see that the basic, just the basic one immediately got aborted with 403 and it's saying this is might be due WAF. So basically our WAF is blocking the traffic so we don't see it. So we can try to send a random user agent. And now uh, this will go through, uh, it will not discover much, but we should actually see the attempt to dump SQL and try some basic WordPress URL, which usually people trying to hack and, and attack. And uh, we should see the alerts immediately and it should be blocked. So let's, let's, let's take a look. So if we, if we refresh it, uh let's put the last one hour and in a few seconds we should start seeing the alerts see so now actually uh this is me right so there is already a security event so we can see the security event which uh which happened just now and you can see that WAF mode block it. Uh, it uh, hit uh, two counts, right? And this is the rule, rule ID which was hit. So this rule ID uh, is sometimes also used when you want to uh, disable some rule IDs because it's you are getting false positive blocks. So then you can you, you immediately see which rule ID blocked your access, and you have information on what uh, that it was actually a wordpress scan agent who, who who tried to scan the site if uh, we refresh we should see the more alerts coming from the second run right so this was this was uh, this was other run where it was trying to do dump sql on on the upload so i immediately see it and in the up firewall you see that last five security events, they are coming here and you can actually filter it, by, uh, filter it out and uh, easily see uh, what is happening. So this is a simple example <clears throat> where I just show you how in a little 15 minutes set up like globally distributed uh, application running in your DC with uh, WAF and DDoS protection and uh, very easy to do. Uh, so now I'm going to pass it back to Pranav for the final slide. Um. Yeah, so um, I think we can open it up for questions since we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, I can open it up for questions, uh, for any questions that people may have. And as a reminder, you can just add your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we do have about three minutes left. So there was one question that was interesting. Um, the, I think the question was, uh, do apps need to be modified in order to use this distributed approach? 
and uh, I think I the chat, but let me just answer for the benefit of everyone. The apps don't need to be modified at all, right? The apps are what you want to develop. Um, you, you can develop the apps in any language, and it could be anywhere, containers, VMs, uh, anywhere. What we do, as I said, is we discover the app. And you discover the app using either DNS-based mechanisms, using using the Kubernetes uh, discovery, using uh, using console discovery, different discovery mechanisms, and you discover the app. And once you discover the app, then your our control plane is then taking the app and advertising the reachability of the app uh, over to different locations, both public as well as private. And then any changes to our control to the control plane, the control plane is essentially a control plane, so that doesn't affect your app. The developer doesn't have to change the app. In order to account for uh, distributor, I think that was the one question I saw. Um, was there any, anything else? Yeah, there were no other questions that I could see in the chat. Um, uh, is there is there any other question? Um, um, is there any other question uh, that was answered uh, that was asked earlier? Um, Justin. Um, let's see here. What is the advantage of distributing load balancing and SSL termination to the network edge? Yeah, one of the uh, uh, one of the big advantages um, that of distributing uh, application delivery functions uh, to the network edge is that firstly these functions take up uh, our performance are compute intensive so they take up a lot of uh, cpu cycles such as uh, ssl termination decrypting the ssl traffic takes up a lot of cpu cycles so distributing it, it out away from a data center conserves cpu cycles on your data center on your public cloud so that's one so it reduces your cost but the more important thing is by distributing the application uh, delivery function closer to where the user is actually improves application performance because to set up a secure connection from the client to the actual app to the server uh, uh, is a is like a six uh, message uh, dance and doing that over long distances where the latency is high actually reduces performance so if you do that setup closer to where the application is and then you have a persistent connection from the network edge to the uh, origin server this way, your performance, all your chattiness is, is you know, in country, for example, and then the, the over the long haul, you're not you're not doing this constant uh, um, um, uh, uh, handshake, which actually improves application performance. So, distributing application functions away uh, and closer to the user improves application performance, uh, inc uh, reduces the uh, risk uh, because all of the attacks are blocked at the edge and uh, reduces your cost. Okay, thank you, Pranav. Um, we unfortunately have to wrap it up now. Any closing closing comments? Uh, no, thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to, uh, to, uh, to Jakob or myself. Uh, we are on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on um, on, on, on email and uh, we, we're happy to answer any of your questions. So this is, this is our handles. Uh, feel free to reach out and we, we can answer any questions offline too. Wonderful. All right, thanks so much everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.